All right, this next section, we're going to be covering some ground here. I do want you to realize, get these here, good, 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 thank you, okay. Now, without faith, is it is impossible to please God. So we always want you to have faith. Our having faith starts the minute we decide to believe God, and then we carry it on and we continue believing. So anything you're believing there should be a continual basis of it. In other words, you start believing and then you continue to believe and you don't stop believing, right? And when you do that, you're in faith. And, whenever you, and then there are times when you can direct your faith towards something to decide to believe that God's word is true about this situation and therefore it will end up like this, right? So that way you're in faith. So I don't, you, I don't want to give you the idea that you don't need faith or anything like that, but I want you to understand where your faith is who your faith is in and how it operates. Now, so I'm going to show you a couple of things. First off, on page 85 of your manual, it says, it is finished. And this was, of course, the statement Jesus made on the cross. And we want to look at this in the light of healing, especially. Every healing from Abraham to Malchus was by faith in what Jesus was going to do. You say, who was Malchus? Remember, he was the one that whenever they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, he was the high priest's servant. Uh, Peter drew his sword. Uh, I personally believe he was aiming for his head and the man moved and he got his ear. Okay, I don't think Peter was just trying to give him a close shave and take off his ear. So <clears throat> Jesus, and we hear the story right here in John 18, that then Jesus took his ear basically and healed him, put it back on. Okay, So uh, <clears throat> every healing from Abraham to Malchus was by faith in what Jesus was going to do. You got that? In other words, so we would say, and, and I'll even give you this definition. Uh, back in the old days, we would talk about, if, let's say way back in the old days, somebody would go to the local general store and say, listen, I need this many bags of seed because I'm going to plant it. And they say, well, okay, well, how are you going to pay for this? Well, I don't have the money right now, but if you'll wait, then I will pay you. When the harvest comes in, I will pay you from that. And so the man would say, well, okay, uh, I'll, I'll uh, actually, today, we would call that getting it by credit, mm -hmm. right? But back then, they would say, okay, I'll give it to you in good faith. In other words, I trust you. I give you, uh, it's in faith. I believe that whenever you get the harvest, you'll bring me and pay me, right? That's the way I want you to see this because that is how every healing took place from Abimelech, from Genesis in chapter 17, all the way through uh, to the garden whenever Jesus healed Malchus's ear. He had, because the Bible only gives us one reason for healing, only one, and that is by his stripes you were healed, right? So that's the only basis of healing we have, okay? And by that, what I mean is technically that is the only legal basis, that is a legal uh, precedent, okay? That it was by his stripes. Now, so, but the problem is, uh, when Jesus was going through all Galilee and healing everybody, he hadn't wore the stripes yet. So in that sense, every person that came to him had to come to him to some degree, or Jesus himself, had to come in faith, believing, number one, that Jesus could do it. But what faith was Jesus operating in? The fact that he was going to pay for this. So all of these healings were done by credit. Do you get that? All those healings that Jesus did and all the healings throughout the Old Testament, every, every healing, every dead raising, all that stuff was all done by credit based on what Jesus was going to do. You got that? Yeah. Now, once you get that, see, now you see why it was so important in the Gospels that you always see faith mentioned. Right? And yet in the New Testament, in, in beyond the Gospels, okay, uh, really in the Acts and all, you know, even on. You don't see faith even mentioned hardly, especially for healing, uh, you know, for people getting healed, okay? And if it was, it was hardly ever the person. There's, there's really only one time that's even mentioned, and that was with Paul, and he said that he saw this man and perceived that he had faith to be healed, so he told him to get up, and he was healed, right? So I want you to understand, if when you, just like Jesus, when Jesus saw faith, he always commended it. He always said, that's good, that's great faith, that's good, right? When he didn't see faith in a person, he didn't 
put him down because of it. You know, I mean, his own disciples were the only ones he ever berated or anything else and, and said, you know, you faithless bunch, how long do I have to put up with you? They, he only said that to his disciples, right? And, and so whenever we see him ministering to people, we know that he had faith in what he was going to do. He knew what he was going to do. And he knew that by his stripes, people were going to be healed. So he knew that he was getting healings done by credit, right? And meaning the legal basis. Now, with that understanding, now let's look forward. If healing is in the atonement, then it's always God's will that someone be healed. If a healing is in the atonement, then you never have to ask God about anyone's healing. In other words, what, God, what is your opinion? Do you want them healed? Should they be healed? Are you going to see that doesn't even come in? If healing is in the atonement and he's already bore the stripes, it's a paid deal. It's a done deal. There is no question. God, get, listen very carefully. God cannot say no to any person's healing. Do you get that? Why? Because he's already said, by his stripes, you were healed. And that is a blanket statement for every person. If we tried to make it where God healed on an individual basis, then we also have to make salvation on an individual basis. We have to mean, well, some can get saved and some can't. God can choose who he wants to save and who he doesn't want to save. And he didn't say that. He said it is not his will that any perish, but everyone come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we can see in Jesus' uh, sacrifice on the cross, paid for every person's salvation, whether or not they receive it. Jesus' payment for healing was paid on, at the whipping post for every person's sickness and disease and every, even every mental ailment. We'll see that in just a minute too. Every type of mental anguish, every bit, spirit, soul, and body. Man's fall through Adam and Eve was a complete and total fall of spirit, soul, and body. Okay? man's redemption through Jesus Christ also must be a complete and total redemption, spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Okay? And so, now, <clears throat> if healing is in the atonement, now, you never have to ask God's opinion or His idea or what it, about anyone's healing. If this is true, then we will not find any reference to Jesus or the disciples ever talking to God about a person's healing. All right? Can you think of any example? where the, Jesus ever really talked to anybody, to, to God, about anybody's healing? Because I can tell you, the only place that even, even comes close to it is at Lazarus' grave. That's the only one. And even then, if you go back and read it, he said, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. And I know you always hear me. And as a matter of fact, the only reason I'm talking to you is so that these standing nearby can know that I'm connected to you. Right? He didn't talk to him about the healing. He didn't talk about, about the resurrection of Lazarus or anything else. He didn't even mention that. He just said, I'm just talking to you so people know who I'm connected to. And then he turned around and said, Lazarus, come forth. Right? And so he, it had nothing to, he wasn't asking God, is this right? Should I do this? That wasn't even a question. Right? So there was never a time where you ever see any evidence of anybody in the New Testament ever talking to God about any person's healing. They never talked to him about it. They never had to pray about it. They never had to pray and see if it was his will, if it, even if it was his timing. They just simply did it, right? Because they knew the price had been paid and every day that somebody, <clears throat> let me put it this way. Let's say you had so many tickets out and they'd gone into warrant. In other words, you didn't pay them and now there were warrants for you. And maybe you knew or didn't know, didn't even think about it, but you got warrants out and if you got stopped, you're going to jail. But then somebody knows you and they hear about it and they go down and they say, you know, I want to pay these tickets. And they paid all those tickets for you. Now, <clears throat> you may not know it, right? And you may, let's say you do know that you got warrants, and, but you don't know that they paid them. You're still going to be living under the condemnation. Every time you see a policeman, you're going to, oh, but don't get in. please pass on by, pass on by, you know. And the funny thing is that nervousness is what draws the cop's attention. Yeah. Okay, that's what draws it, so. And, and, and that's when you start making mistakes. Hey, listen, a policeman can follow any person a block or two and find ample reason to pull them over, right? They don't even, just in their normal driving, okay? I don't know if you know it or not, but you can turn right on red, yeah. right? You can turn right on red here in, in most states. Now, you can do that. I, I'm just saying that because I, I see people every day that don't know that, right? Because they, they, they will sit there, okay? And, and, and you're trying to turn right on red and you're kind of like, why are you in this lane? 
You should be over there so I can turn, right? <laughs> Another thing is, too, if you turn and you turn from a right lane, turn into the right lane, right? Okay. Turn straight into the same lane. Don't turn three lanes over, yeah. right? And if you got to turn, don't turn from three lanes over and zip across three lanes. That's <clears throat> Grace, peace, and mercy multiplied to them. Amen. <laughs> God, give them wisdom and teach them how to drive. Okay, so, so, so that's part of the things that need to be taught. Okay, it would it would give peace throughout the realm if we would do that. Okay, so, but now, so how I got off on of that? Anyway, look at this. He says here, if healing is in the atonement. It is a fact to be believed and acted upon, not a matter of having enough faith. Right? I mean, because really, what makes you, if you think you don't have enough faith for healing, then what makes you really think you had enough faith to get saved? Are you sure you're saved? I mean, you know, oh, I'm saved. How do you know? How, how do you know you had enough? Right? I mean, because you probably hadn't died yet and seen heaven or hell. So you're not sure. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, Absolutely sure. I mean, you believe, right? But what makes you think you have enough faith to get saved, which is the greatest thing, and yet you don't have enough faith to get your body healed? See what I'm saying? We, we analyze. Why? Because one we see and the other we don't. And yet the one we, that we don't see, that's when we have to have faith. In the, in the face of all contrary evidence, faith is what you need. Amen? So... If healing is in the atonement, you need never worry about enough faith. Instead, it's a matter of stubbornness. At what point do you give up your right and inheritance? At what point do you decide, I don't have it? Never. So see, it really comes down to that. Now, if healing is in the atonement, it's not a matter of getting God to okay a healing or grant a healing or flip a switch in heaven, right? Or send a healing. That's not it. It's already paid for. It's already done. Psalm 107, verse 20, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. John 1, 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1, 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What are we saying with these three verses? <clears throat> he sent His word and healed them. Jesus is the word that He sent. His word was sent. He did it. He accomplished it. He said it is finished. It now turn the page and let's read the next statement. If healing is in the atonement, it is an established fact. It is already done. God has made us a standing offer of forgiveness and healing through the crucifixion. Psalm 103 verses 2 through 6. And Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, a thing to notice here, I was going to say this yesterday, and I don't think I mentioned it. We know that the word griefs and sorrows means sicknesses and diseases. Okay? But you will notice these same words uh, for born and carried, we talked about yesterday, were in verses 11 and 12. So that we know that whatever he did with our sins and, and, and uh, iniquities, he did with our sicknesses and diseases. We went all this over all this yesterday. The amazing thing is, when he talks about our sins and iniquities, he just makes a statement that he did these. But notice here in verse 4, it starts by saying, surely. In other words, in between the two verses that talk about sin and iniquity, and then the other verse that talks about sickness and disease, the only time he used the word surely was in dealing with sickness and disease. Isn't that he didn't even say surely about our sins and iniquities. Now, why do you think he... Because God... Uh, you know, he, he's very conscious of the words he says. Why do you think he said surely for that one and didn't say it for our sins and iniquities? Could it be because he knew what man was going to happen? Because you have to remember during the time when Jesus was on the earth, they had no problem with him healing. That was, oh yeah, healing, no problem. Forgive sins, whoa, 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 whoa. Right? And isn't it amazing how that has totally flipped? Now we have no problem. You know why that is? Is because we have preached forgiveness of sin so long and so strong that we are well trained in it. Even sinners know it. But we have not been as well trained in healing, especially in healing of the atonement. It hasn't been preached uh, long enough, strong enough, loud enough, uh, adamant enough for, for that to be a solid. But do you realize that if we preach healing the way we have preached salvation, that it won't be long before the same faith that we have in salvation in the people 
the people will have the same faith for healing that they do for salvation if we preach it the same way we preach salvation. You get that? And I believe now, especially because we have completely flipped that, whereas, as I said, used to, uh, you know, heal. Oh, yeah. Uh, forgive sins. Forget it. No, that's, you can't do that. Well, I believe that God knew that that would take place so that whenever he knew that when we were looking at these verses, we would be able to look and go, surely, absolutely, without a doubt, he has borne our, our sicknesses and our diseases. Why? Because we need that extra emphasis from God himself that he has borne our sicknesses and diseases and there is absolutely no doubt about it. All right? Now, look what he says. <clears throat> this is why, well, let me go back up. Here we see, once again, the joining of the atonement with healing of physical sickness. This is why 1 Peter 2.24 is technically in the past tense in this. The deposit or prepayment for your healing has been made. By whose stripes you were healed. It's a done deal. You are technically, spiritually, legally speaking, you are in a state of healed. Right? Now the problem is, just like before, whenever his, he had forgiven your sins, there came a point where you had to accept it. It is, it is exactly the same thing with healing. Now, you, many people in the beginning have to accept that healing is for them. But then they have to go beyond that and accept that healing is for everyone and therefore we have the responsibility to bring it to them. Right? Now, as far as God is concerned, you have been healed. He's done all that needs to be done. There's nothing more He needs to do. Right? And now all we have to do is learn to agree with Him. Agree with His Word, believe His Word, and then act as if it is true. Because it is. Okay? So if, so if there's still pain or sickness in your body, now notice this, and we want to make this clear. We are not saying that sickness does not exist. Okay? It does exist. What we're saying is it does not have the legal right to exist in your body. We're not saying it's not there. We're just saying it's there illegally. and It does not have the right to be there. And because of that, we understand that if it's there, it is always an enemy to be fought and defeated, never to be something that is embraced or uh, thought of as something that God is using as a tool or something to teach us or to train us or to make us better, right? If you look at the heart of God, now understand God has uh, mercy, right? He has compassion on the sick. I'm not saying that he doesn't, right? But if you look at the heart of God, God's heart through Jesus is always to serve, not be served. Is that true? Would, would, everybody's pretty settled on that. I mean, it's like, okay, we know that Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he was doing that as an example. And we should be the same way. Our heart should always be to serve and not to be served. Do we agree with that? Amen. Yeah. Okay. Here is one of the evidence, just one, just one small evidence that healing or that sickness, I should say it the right way that sickness or disease can never be God's will. Why? Because sickness and disease, if it doesn't make you have to be served, it at least makes you want to be served. Because you can't serve when you're sick. What that means is if you're sick in bed, can't get around in a wheelchair, can't somehow, there's something going on, that you cannot, it causes you to be in a place where you cannot serve to the fullness that you could if you were healed. Rather, usually, it makes people have to serve you. They have to bring you chicken soup, right? They have to, <laughs> they have to take you to the doctor. They have to, they have to wait on you. Now, again, please understand I'm not being harsh. I'm not, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. It's what it is. Sickness and disease makes you in a or put you in a place where generally you have to be served and you cannot serve as well. Now, I know there are people who have various problems and they pray and they pray for people and they intercede and they do things. And that is wonderful. But that's not all God told you to do. See, that's our problem. Well, but and I know there are very famous people that are in wheelchairs and things that have been paralyzed and things, and they have made an entire ministry out of that, right? And, you know, they're making lemonade out of lemons. I, I get that, right? 
but to turn around and say, no, this was God's will for me. This, this is my ministry because God ordained this for me. Okay, they have absolutely no basis on Scripture. That is strictly them deciding to change and make the circumstances, or I should say, make the Bible fit circumstances rather than make the circumstances fit the Bible. Amen. Right? So I'm not, a, please understand, we're not against people that are sick, all right? We're for you. We have compassion and we want you well. One of the reasons we want you well is so that you can better serve God in fullness of spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. If you're in a situation where you cannot serve God bodily, then that's one third of your total being that you are not able to present to God as a living sacrifice in fullness. Amen? Amen. And again, our goal is to get you well, spirit, soul, and body, so you can do all of the things you're supposed to, right? Say, just as another example, there are places that you can go in this world, and we are told to go into all the world, and there are places that you can go that you can't get medicine. So if that were true, I mean, if, it is, if God's will is for you to be sick, then he's going against his own word for you to go into all the world because you can't go there and stay. You can't go there and do it. You say, well, I could take medicine with me. And you better hope it lasts and you better hope. And, but the, the problem is now it's, it's your medicine and the supply of medicine determining how long you can stay somewhere as opposed to the will of God. So see, we can go at this a thousand different ways and it all adds up the same every time, all right? So the purpose is not to have anything. When, when I first started ministering, back then, it was a big deal. You know, Wigglesworth had one, so everybody had to have one. You say, what are you talking about? He had this little vial that he carried oil in and he had one specially made. So back in the day, back in the 70s, everybody had their oil, right? Everybody had their little vial of oil. And if you're a Christian, you know, especially a spirit-filled Christian, oh, you had to have your anointing oil, right? Like if you didn't, that, that showed how spiritual you were. You know, if you didn't have that, you, you were a newbie. I mean, you were <laughs> brand new and you didn't know, all right? But, it, but if somebody started to pray, bless God, you could whip out that anointing oil and it showed you knew your stuff, right? And so I had that, right? Like everybody else, I had my anointing oil. And then I realized one day I went to Walmart. If you might get the idea, I spent a lot of time at Walmart. I do, and my, our whole family did, okay? And that was where we started ministering. And so I went to Walmart and I saw this sick person and I wanted to minister to them. And so I, I you know, you check your pocket for your anointing oil, right? And I started, and I'm like, man, I left it at home. I'll catch them next time. You, you see? And when I realized that, I realized right then. Now, the, where I got that idea from of, okay, I've got to eliminate that. Why? Because I want to eliminate anything that would stop me or hinder me from fulfilling God's will. Okay. When I was in martial arts, I studied uh, empty hand, but a lot of my training had to do with uh, stick and knife. It had to do with a uh, single stick, double stick, single knife, all that. And so I, could, I practiced with it a lot. And because of that, I felt very comfortable with it. And then I noticed one time when I, again, same type of situation. It's amazing how these things correlate to it together. I went out somewhere and then reached back and didn't have my knife. I'm like, and then I re and you had that moment where you feel like, oh, now I got to pay more attention, you know, because I don't have my knife, and, because it wasn't just a tool; it was a, a weapon. Okay, and so the idea when I felt that, and I thought, you know what, I need to quit training so much with stick and knife. I need to go back and train empty hand. Why? Because you will never catch me without these, right? You might catch me without my weapons, but you'll never catch me without these. So I went back. I laid down the stick and knife. I didn't train with it as much. I still did it to keep my skills up, but that was it. The rest of the time was all empty hand. And, it was, and that way I never felt like I was unarmed, right? And so whenever I did that with the, with the uh, anointing oil, it was exactly the same thing. I realized, okay, I've got to lay that down so that it doesn't hinder me. I have to realize that I don't need the oil to get people healed, which by the way, if you're going to be ministering to people in Walmart I, or anywhere other than church, Anointing oil is not the way to do it, right? Especially nowadays, because they don't know what you're going to pour on them, right? You, you say, excuse me, can I, can I, can I help you? Uh, can, I, can I do something for you? Yeah, what's that? Well, hang on just a second. Okay, okay, here we go, you know. No, you, okay, you're going to have security real quick, okay? And so, it, and, and I know even if you put your finger on it and dip it and all that kind of stuff, but you have to remember, that's only mentioned for us in James, 
and only for brand new believers who have called people to come to them, right? There's no other mention of it. Now, I understand in Acts, or actually in the Gospels, it says that the disciples anointed many with oil and, and ministered to them. So that, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just a time and a place, mm -hmm. all right? And it's, it's the same thing that you don't have to explain as much if you're not using oil, Amen. right? And you don't have to pay for people's cleaning. Mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 you know, you start getting oil on people's clothing, they get upset, right? Even if you get them healed, they'll still get upset because their clothes get mad. Or you get, start putting oil in their hair, it, it, people don't like it, right? So it's just better. So what I did was when I started studying healing, my whole purpose was to go in and strip away everything that was unnecessary so that we could go in. You'll notice we don't, okay. Is there a benefit to having music playing and having gospel words said and you're in it? Does it help create an atmosphere? It helps create a mental atmosphere, yeah. Is it good for a church service? Yeah, it doesn't hurt, right? Uh, but you're not going to have it on the street, right? You're not going to be able to take your you know, worship CD to the uh, customer service in Walmart and say, would you put this on? Because uh, I'll be on aisle three with a healing line. So I need, I need the atmosphere set. No, it's, it's not going to work that way, right? You're not going to have that at the bus stop. You're not going to have that at the gas station. And so, and the problem is people start to relying on that stuff. And they start thinking, well, if the atmosphere isn't created, I can't do this. And we have to realize we are the atmosphere. Amen. We, we set the atmosphere. Wherever we go, the atmosphere is right for healing, right? I don't have to set it. Listen, the more we have to do to set things up, the least or the less spiritual it is and the more psychological it becomes. And that's what we want to stay away from. We don't want this to be psychological. Are there psychosomatic healings? Absolutely. Do they happen in church? You bet they do, right? Some healings are psychosomatic, uh, you know, variables and smaller healings, things like that, because people expect certain things and they get it. And they think, when I get there, I'm going to get healed. And they walk through the door and they get healed. Part of that was psychosomatic. Part of it was the fact that they believed that they set their faith when they got there, we were going to heal and they got it, right? But the whole point is, we don't want this to be psychological. We want, the, because psychological, uh, you know, you get in a state of mind and you get free. And if you go back to the state of mind, you get it back. So we don't want it psychological. We want it spiritual. When you get free, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen. So I stripped away all of these things. Found out, isn't it amazing that the one way Jesus tells us to heal the sick is that believers shall lay hands on the sick and we're never without these. We've always got them. Isn't that right? He didn't say you had to do any of these other things. Matter of fact, he said faith. Whenever you look at it, faith is the best thing God could require because it's the only thing that every person can choose to have. Right? All this other stuff, uh, you know, having a gift, who knows? Right? Having an impartation from somebody, well, here, I see you're sick. Let me go get an impartation from this great healer over here and I'll get it and I'll bring it to you. No, see, there's always this stuff. God wants us to realize you're connected to him and all you need to do is be there. That's all you need. Be there and decide to believe. So that's what we've done with this, with this teaching is we've gone through the Bible, taken out all of the stuff uh, from, the, from the normal teaching in churches, looked at it according to the Bible, taken out these traditions and just stripped it down. And that's why this is not for healing services, even though it works in healing services, but it is for the street. It is for every day. We have to take healing out of the realm of the event and put it into the realm of lifestyle, right? That's the one thing we need to realize. When you go back and you read through the Gospels, you read through the book of Acts, he said, as you go. He, now, we get up sometimes, we'll say, I'm going to go to the store. I'm going to go look for people to pray for. You know, we get up, we go to the breaks. Well, let's go look for people to pray for. That's, do you realize how far advanced that is spiritually from just 15 years ago? That's light years ahead of where it was 15 years ago. 25 years ago, forget it. You had to have a leading. You had to have a vision. You had to have something. You know, you had to, you had to know that you were anointed. You had to know that you had a gift. You had to know that you were being led and led who to pray. All of that. You realize all those things that we used to think was so important have all been stripped away now. And we realize that this is who we are. Wherever we go, we carry the Spirit of God with us. Wherever we go, we can minister healing. And we, get, we have the freedom of this being a lifestyle. So now as we go, we can choose to go and find people to pray for, or we can just, as we go, and you get up in the morning and you go to the grocery store, and if you see somebody sick, guess what? They get, they, they, you know, today's your lucky day. You cross my path, right? 
And that's how Jesus healed most of the time. You realize Jesus didn't always go out of his way to find people. There were times, right? But most of the time, as he was walking, somebody would say, hey, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, and they would call his attention. He'd go, oh, yeah, okay. And he would always help them. But it was as he went. And he said, I'm sending you into all these cities where I myself am coming to. I'm coming there. So you go and heal the sick. And when I get there, don't make me heal the sick. You get it all done. When I get there, I'll just be the king coming in after the kingdom has been prepared. Right? And yet now we try to make it into an event, into a special thing, into a service or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that per se other than just like with healing rooms. Dr. Lakes really started the healing rooms, kind of. Okay? They were healing homes before that, but he really uh, pushed the healing rooms where people would come in. Back in the old day, people would come to a home and live there, like with Dowie. They would come there and live there, stay there until they were healed. They would live, sleep, eat, fellowship, teach, learn, all that there. Dr. Lake said, people don't have to move here. They can just come visit. They can come to the healing rooms, come in, be prayed for, go home, right? Get healed, go home. Whatever, if they need to come several times, they can. Now, that's great. It was an advancement. The problem is now, whenever the healing rooms started getting popular again, instead of doing the way the Bible said to do it, we, see, we, the, the Bible wants us to take it out of the church building to the people. But the healing rooms just, we took it out of the church building and we put it into a smaller room and we kept it in the church. See, that's why I'm not big on the healing rooms. Uh, you know, I, I thank God for them and, you know, we, we, we agree, okay? Uh, but the point is not about taking it from a big room to a smaller room off on the side. The point is get this in your life and take it out to the people that need it. People that will never come to the healing rooms. Take it out to them. Take it to them and let them see God is so good and so big that he can heal you on a street corner. He can heal you, you know, in the produce aisle. He, it, none of that matters to him. He created heaven and earth. Do you realize almost all the people that got healed, right? Especially from Adam all the way up to, you know, even Jesus' day, pretty close to Jesus' day. If people got healed, many times they were in fields. They were in houses. They were in, they, they weren't, they weren't all healed in the temple, right? If Adam ever got healed, he was healed in a garden atmosphere, okay? That'd be like the produce aisle at Walmart, okay? So there's not an atmosphere that we have to set. You get that? And so the whole point is that we're trying to get you to take this out. Now, saying that, I want us to, here, here's the point. All, all of the people, and some of them didn't even know this, but Jesus knew it. He knew that everybody he healed it was based on what he was going to do. So they were all looking forward. Well, whenever you look at something you don't have, you need faith, right? To, have, to, to understand that you have something that you don't see, you need faith, right? And then when you get the thing, you don't need faith anymore, right? Because you got the thing. So you only need faith while you don't have the thing. Is that, that's Bible, right? You get it? So now Jesus was saying, there's going to come a point where I'm going to have stripes on my back and that's going to take care of everybody's healing. But so now I'm healing everybody based on the fact that I'm going to pay for this later. Think about that. Every time. Now, if you knew you were going to pay for something later, you think you might, you know, I'm going to take this beating. So as many as I can get healed, I want to throw them in. You know what I'm saying? He wouldn't be going, well, let me think about it. No, he's going to say, I'm fixing to give my back. Yeah, you're good. Don't worry. I'll heal you. Why? Because my back is worth you getting healed. Right? You understand what I'm talking about here? And so Jesus was looking forward and he was saying he was looking forward in faith and, and God had to have faith in him that he would do it, go through it. And we know there came a point where he said, Lord, if there's any other way, think about that. He was that close. Now what, I'm just going to throw you a hypothetical, okay? What if, let, let me, let's move it forward. Let's go up to a point where Jesus is arrested. They come, they get him, they take him to Pilate. Pilate examines him and says, I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, you know, this man doesn't deserve to die. Uh, and they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, no, nah, he doesn't deserve to die. Uh, but I'll tell you what, he, you know, he's caused some trouble. So take him and whip him, right? Go give him the, the scourge. Now, you know, of course, that he did not receive 39 stripes. Okay, he was whipped under, Jew, under Roman law, not under Jewish law. The 39 stripes, the 40 stripes minus one, that was Jewish law. Whenever the Romans... Uh, whip someone, scourge them with a, what we would call a cat-of-nine-tails, it wasn't 39 stripes. 
it, m many of the people that were whipped died because they were so whipped. The uh, movie, The Passion of the Christ, was the closest to what it actually looked like. The Bible said his appearance was so marred that you couldn't even tell he was a man. Now think about that. And so he went through all that. But now, get this, whenever they finished whipping him, then they took him back to Pilate, right? Now we know that once he was whipped, what did that do? By his stripes, they were healed, right? So <clears throat> once that was done, healing was, it was secure, right? Healing wasn't even a question. <clears throat> what if Pilate had said, he's done enough. You know, he's been through enough. He was whipped. <clears throat> uh, set him free. You mean don't, don't put him on the cross? Yeah, we're not going to crucify him. <clears throat> he was whipped and that's enough. So he'll go free. What does that mean? Well, that would mean that today anybody could get healed, but nobody could get saved. You see, that's how separated these two events were. You get it? We always put them together. <clears throat> but it was a whipping post that paid for our healing. It was the cross that paid for our sins. Yeah. Right? So imagine if he had been whipped and then released. Healing would be fluent. Right? But salvation, nobody could get saved. You got that? Now, imagine almost the reverse. What if... Whenever they said, crucify him, Pilate said, yep, good, take him, crucify him. What? No whipping? No, just take him, crucify him. So then what if somehow the plan of God could have been thwarted and there had been no whipping? Well, then nobody could be healed, right? But even worse than that, since everything he did was based on the fact that by his stripes we were healed, all those healings that he did, if he had been crucified and not whipped, every person that had been healed would have instantly been sick again. Every person with leprosy that had been cleansed instantly would have had leprosy again. Why? Because the basis of their healing would have been removed. Do you get that? See, once you start getting these kind of pictures, you start to see how easy it is to minister, how sure it is, it's paid for, there's no question about it, and you can see it as this situation that you can actually activate, I don't say on your own, but at your own will. You can choose to go do this, right? And a person, and there's been people that, that uh, friends of ours actually that preached and, and used to say, well, I'll, I'll pray for your healing uh, after you get saved. You get, you get saved, because if you don't get saved, then you, know, you don't deserve any of the benefits. But uh, you, you, get, uh, you get saved and then I'll pray for you and God will heal you. And over a period of time, those same people heard what we preach about the goodness of God draws men to repentance. That the goodness of God, He will heal even sinners. Why? Because He makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. Right? God is good to all. So if there's, if there's bad, let me tell you, it's the devil. Right? You know, one of the scriptures, well, I should tell you, the, the person I'm talking about, they actually changed over time. And now they're saying the same thing. Now they're saying, oh, I'll pray for you and get you healed and then you'll want to serve God. And they changed. And whenever I first started preaching it, People say, well, that's not what he says. And I said, yeah, well, well, who are you to go against what he said? And I'm like, I'm a guy with a Bible that can read. That's who I am, right? <laughs> it's not because I'm some this or some that. That doesn't matter. It's the fact that that's what the Word says, right? It's not because I'm in this position in the body of Christ or anything else. It's not a, 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 some kind of contest between his function and my function. It's a matter of Bible, Right? And so once you stand on that, then if you get on the Bible, you can stand against anybody's words if they're not the same Bible. And it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter how many initials they have after their name or anything else. None of that matters. All that counts is what has God said, right? And then you can go back to that. And if you stand long enough, it's funny how the world, you know, the, the church world seems to turn and kind of line up behind you after a while. Why? If you stay true, you stay true to the Word of God and you, and you keep on going, eventually it comes around. Most people... <clears throat> If you get a hold of Bible truth, you're usually about 10, 15, 20, 25 years ahead of the church. And so it's obvious when you start saying it, they're going to blast you for it. But if you keep on saying it and you keep on going, you keep on doing what you're supposed to do, generally they'll catch up. Right? And the whole thing is you just be faithful and keep saying it. No matter what, you keep doing what you're supposed to do. Now, I was getting at all that because I want you to see the difference between whenever Jesus paid for our healing, even if a person doesn't get saved, they can still get healed. 
right? Now, the enemy, of course, will come and attack them again and all that kind of stuff. So that goes on. So we want to be able to make sure that, yeah, if we get somebody healed, we want to get them saved. We want to get them filled with the Spirit of God. We want these things to happen. And that was one of the questions that people have about uh, getting saved and, and the, having the Spirit and these things happening with them. And they say, you know, don't, weren't, uh, one of the questions was whenever um, Paul laid hands on people, uh, and, and they received the Spirit. Didn't they already have the Spirit because they had believed? Well, they had the Spirit in the sense that they were born of the Spirit, right? But they had not received the Spirit as Jesus had said, which was the promise of the Father, which was to, to come. So that was a reception of power. What you have to remember is, and we, we actually do a teaching on the truth about the Holy Spirit baptism, so we need to, uh, we're we'll probably doing that here again pretty soon. You have to realize <clears throat> when you get born again, you have faith, and by faith, you can do everything that you need to do and have for yourself, okay? But the baptism of the Spirit, meaning what, what's generally called that, with the uh, <clears throat> speaking in other tongues, the gifts, that kind of stuff, that's not for your personal so much as it is for ministry, uh, meaning to help others, right? So when you get born again, you got everything you need for you. But whenever the Spirit comes upon you and you receive the Spirit, now you have power and now, and this is why I said, when you get born again, to, to as many as received him, gave you power, authority to become the sons of God. So the minute you get born again, you become a son with all the benefits that a son has. Then because you're a son, he sends his spirit. Whenever you receive his spirit, now understand, when you get born again, you are a son or daughter of the living God. Okay? When you receive the baptism of the spirit, now you learn how to act like a son or a daughter the way that Jesus acted like one. Right? So by faith, Dr. Lake, uh, John Lake, Alexander Dowie, all those guys, they were all able to minister by faith without what we see as the baptism of the Spirit. And they ministered by faith that they had by being born again. Then we understood or started to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we realized that there was something else that gave us power that made it easier. Right? And now when you mix faith with power, Oh, everything, it's, it's a whole different world. Everything is so much easier and you, it's not near the strain uh, many times as it is when you just try to do it by faith. Faith shouldn't be a strain either, but many times it, you're trying to reach out for others and give them something you have as opposed to having the Spirit of God upon you that makes it so much easier to give out that power. All right? So, we got to send you to lunch. We will be back here at 2 o'clock and we'll pick this back up. <music>